So the topic today is nonprofit video marketing, how we can reduce the tech and actually increase the marketing. So I think this is going to be a really practical session today on what you can do as a nonprofit to actually meet your goals, not just make a really fancy video that a board member might get excited about. And so our presenter today is David Fu. And so David is the co-owner of Nonprofit Video Communications, and he teaches small nonprofits to do their own video marketing. He helps their viewers donate, sign up, and get much needed services. And he does that through these very simple videos that help people now and quickly. So these are not fluffy brand campaigns or cute videos that tickle your own fancy, but these are videos that actually get things done for your nonprofit. So with that, I'm going to get under the way and pass it over to Dick. Thanks, Eli. Thanks, Ben. I'd like to start by saying I live on the traditional territory of the Konyo Kehaga. The island, Montreal, is known as Chochage, historically a meeting place for other indigenous nations including Algonquin people. So before we start, I want to leave you with a thought that took in mind throughout the entire hour here. And it is this, that videos actually don't do anything. Uh, that is a bad for business and I shouldn't say that, but it's true. Video is just a, a format. It's just like a video file. It's a DB it on its own. It's just a bunch of pictures that move with some sound. And uh, even the best videos do nothing. And even the crappiest videos do nothing on their own. And uh, don't be fooled by the other videos you see online. I know there's a lot of a sort of interest and curiosity and maybe even some FOMO or envy regarding people doing really well on Instagram videos, on TikTok videos, on YouTube videos, on advertisements and other social videos. Don't be fooled by it. You just never know what's actually how they measure success on their side. And what does make video do something, which applies to anything from books to, to articles or what have you, is their positioning and their messaging. So even if you have no money and no time, and it's the worst video on earth, I promise you, it's not the video that matters. It's the messaging and the positioning. And I want to show you today how to think about that, to alleviate and liberate your expectations of video and how to make them more effective. So let's continue. So I want you to take one minute to yourself and just think, what service did you need recently? And Examples might be, you meet, maybe you're looking for a family doctor or you're looking for a loan. You want to hire someone to fix plumbing or you want to do it yourself. Perhaps it's a, an essential or even a non-essential purchase. You want to know some information about it and whatever it is important to you. And when you were needing it and searching for it or asking around, or calling around, was there missing information that would have helped you? Useful, vital, urgent information that would have helped you make a decision or would have helped you move forward in some way. So if you found those results, whether it was on Google map reviews or whether it was on YouTube, like a tutorial, or whether it was in a, just a quick Google search or maybe Facebook marketplace, whatever it was, you found information because somebody out there predicted and knew and forecasted that someone like you needed that information. So they placed it there. And so for, the, for those of you who did not find the information you need, it's because someone didn't post it. They did not post vital information. So you did not find it. So this is where you fit in. This is the method we're going to talk about today. So vital informational gaps. Of all the categories of videos that can work, so we're talking about entertaining videos, funny videos, uh, entries, interviews, webinars, advertisements, animations, of all the types of videos you could make, I think 
when you're a, a small nonprofit, tight for resources, tight for money, tight for time, the easiest and very effective approach to making your videos should be to fill those information gaps. If you want to start making your own videos at your organization, your number one job is not to make beautiful videos, excuse me, is not to make beautiful videos. It's or to hire a, a crew or use that storyboard free resource from a conference or start filling in that uh, the story plot. I think your number one job in this method is to fill the vital informational gaps. And I'll explain as we go why this is easy. So what is vital information? The first one is the most embarrassingly basic market question. So when I say embarrassing, there is probably a handful or more questions you're not answering about your own organization out there. This would be a great place to start. Vital information would be, how much does it cost? Why does this youth program cost nothing? And why does the other youth program cost $20 per session? Why, why does, what does the shuttle service, how often does it run to pick up my grandmother for her seniors day activity? What does the camp look like that I'm about to send my child to overnight for a week? I think probably some of you are nodding. I can't see your faces, but I bet you, you can automatically think of information that people email you and call you about that. It's very common, yet you have not written it somewhere online. You can make videos about that. One more category for vital information is this. Educate people. And educate them about their needs and their issues. So for example, if you are a, uh, an immig immigration and settlement agency, all the topics about that and instead of coming up with catchy quotes or cat gifs to capture attention, because I think that tends to be a method, try to catch attention and then lead them through your website. I think just give it all to them in one go, a post about here's a workaround for documents that need translation uh, on the Canadian government website. Here is, uh, here are three tips for a job search in this particular region. Here are three industries that are hiring right now for this particular age range or skills. You deal with this stuff every single day. It's your expertise. And it's actually like the number, I'm just making that up, but I think it's up there. It's a high priority reason for being on the internet at all is to look for answers. So this is your opportunity to show up with your bottomless well of knowledge and use that as content. So why is a crappy homemade shaky and bad lighting video okay in this case? It's because of, it's because if your information can solve a problem or save a life or fill a vital information gap, that video is going to look pretty good to the viewer. It's going to be a welcome relief to something that they're looking for. And regardless if it's a video, it could just be a text post. I think you understand where I'm going with it. And the internet is increasingly rewarding and preferring authentic videos. Product manager at YouTube said that the the videos that win the most eyeballs and the most impressions are the ones that give cues for authenticity. That means you get the feeling that it's off the cuff. You get the feeling that it's from a place of passion. You get a feeling that is, that it is, as Summer says, it is not memorized and scripted or reading a teleprompter. You get a feeling that, so just like me, I, I'm, I'm stuttering, blah. And it seems people are needing that right now. That's why TikTok and YouTube are doing great. So the internet increasingly prefers authentic. And the, and there's one more thing you've got to know about authentic videos is that I have no explanation for this, but device manufacturers are increasingly making your devices a video first device. 
So there's the catch up thing happening here where how can I present content that the manufacturers have made a priority, but in a way is interesting because if I'm a single parent who's in a rush and I'm taking the bus with three children and I'm looking up for vital information on a website, I'm probably not in the best place right now to be scrolling a wall of text, but I might click on a video and the video will do the rest of the work for me. So to summarize this, two categories of vital informational gaps. One is the most basic market questions, the ones that you just will surprise you. And two, educate them about their own needs, not yours. So some results I've seen with uh, this method of, of this approach to homemade videos that just address the most vital, most basic questions is that you might notice small wins if you post, let's say on Instagram, three, a, a myth buster, let's say, is it true that, no, I'm going to make up something else. One indicator that you are in an abusive relationship and you don't know it. One indicator, 30 second video. You might, if you had a proper and clear call to action or invitation to something, you might see a spike in website visits just at that time. Now. When you, when you, the hope tends to be with video that you're going to go viral or suddenly your server is going to break down from too many visits. But if you got 10 or 20 website visits that you did not get yesterday, that's a really good return on just making a 30 second video. And you can analyze what page did they land on? Did they go, did they, you can, in your Google analytics, you can follow, did they go to which page after, or did they stick around a long time or not? But just one vital piece of information that drew somebody in gives you just a few more hints at how to reach people better. Another example of a win I've seen with a completely uncinematic, boring homemade video is a, a Zoom conversation between two staff where they questioned each other for about two, half an hour. What's it like to work at this office? And they attached that to a job application and a couple things happened. People in their cover letters and in their interviews would regularly quote the video and they would say they saw themselves working there. They saw themselves working with the people in the video and I can't verify or prove this, but the, uh, the employer seems to believe that it helped applicants self-select as well. They weren't seeing as many unqualified applicants, probably because they watched the video. Right now is a chance to increase those email open rates. And uh, I don't know how long that'll last. I know with email campaigns that the people get bored pretty quick, but I know that in, in the first initial push for adding video to your newsletters, if you give them a great sort of introduction, here's a summary of today's newsletter. If you want to hear this directly from the executive director, please click on this three minute video or, Hey, a particular level of donor. We made a video for you. We would love for you to watch it. And it's a dramatic increase in simply opening the email at all. And then the final big one here is visibility on Google and YouTube. Some of that Google owns YouTube. There's nothing we can do about that. There's a bit of a game to play here. And that is the search visibility. We all know it's very competitive to get your website seen on Google. And we know it's competitive to get your articles placing in the first few pages. But YouTube results, Google is prioritizing putting video results at the very top. So if you Google how to repair a roof, I think even the most popular 10 year old article about repairing your roof will show up, but a fairly new how to fix your own roof video will appear even higher. And it's a new push from Google to place of videos. So the opportunity is right now. The whole thing is in its infancy. I'll give you an example of a video I made. So I made a fake video where I filmed my feet, but my feet were just doing this. And I called it some string of words, newcomer, immigrant, job, search, help, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And it did very well for two days. And I think YouTube or viewers or some robot or algorithm are all seeing big brother thing determined pretty quickly. It's fake, 
But what I really wanted to know is just how big of an opportunity do we have with, with search terms and YouTube? And I think it's pretty good the more niche you are. So I recommend if you're going to make, let's say, recording this webinar for Eli and then posting it on YouTube, that you just be very clear about what this is about, who it's for, and the region. Don't be clever. Don't be funny. Don't use expressions. Just say exactly what it is. And the opportunity on Google and YouTube is that the clearer the search terms, the more it serves searchers. I'm going to go to YouTube and type video marketing for nonprofits, Canada. And I'm not going to type some cute, clever title, nonprofit stories, or I don't know, I can't make one up right now. But generally, if you're looking for solutions, you're being pretty clear in your search. So it's up to you to show up and accommodate. So what do all these have in common? They're homemade, they're done fast, they're positioned, and they're precise, and they're audience first. This, the positioning and the precision and being audience-minded is what will make even the most plain videos succeed. You may be later, if you have a ton of money, you can get into higher production. So I would like to try this out. Uh, usually, I do this on Zoom. And uh, I can talk to people, but maybe we can just do this in the chat. I would like to, maybe I could use Ben or Eli as an example, since they already have their mic and camera. And then yeah, I can ask, yeah. I can, we can just try this method out in front of everyone. Unscripted. So, unscripted. I promise. Ben. Yes. <laughs> at, I want, so, so I, I actually only know a little bit about TechSoup and TechSoup Connect and at the BC chapter. Let's pretend. Let's go with that. I'm searching and trying to understand what you all even do there. And uh, let's say that I'm on LinkedIn and I, I see you around. I see you around. I see that the word tech soup is connected to you, but I still don't even really know why tech and why soup. So let's pretend that's all I know about you. And what, I guess what I want to know is what could you tell me in three sentences, what does TechSoup even do? I can tell you from my experience that it connects technology groups and companies and nonprofits in a way that shares ideas and information and, <clears throat> excuse me, and benefit to both. I don't know if that's a good summation or not, but that's the way I view it. Doesn't matter. Let's elaborate <laughs> for one more minute here. So what does that look like for, let's say a, a nonprofit who gets in contact with you? What is one thing that happens to their benefit. Question. I hate to defer to Eli. He's more the expert than I am. Sure. Eli, you can answer that. Yeah, I make the too close to it, which is often the danger. I'm going to flip into jargon, but so basically all profits don't want to throw their money away on software. And so luckily TechSoup has partnered with about 120 software companies to open up exclusive discounts for both free and cheaper software for nonprofits right. around the world. And the way you do that is you create your free account, prove that you are a nonprofit in your country, and then go to this amazon.com like online shopping cart to basically say, oh, I want to my half price. Drop it in the shopping cart and check out. Boom. So that's what we do at text. So I want the room to know that everything that we just did with Ben and Eli is a video. I could, I could stop right there and not even edit it. And let's post it today. Starting with, uh, my interview where I'm like, Ben, what does TechSoup even do? And then edit that part out and Ben starts talking. And then we stop after Eli's, Eli's contribution and you post it with the title. What does TechSoup even do? And what happens when I sign up? And so that to Ben and Eli might seem way too basic and to many organizations might seem like way too low quality and might be feeling very shy about not saying it perfectly, but none of that stuff matters because I'm willing to bet there are enough nonprofits and small nonprofits and startup nonprofits Googling 
tech and nonprofits, subscriptions and nonprofits, computers and nonprofits. And if Ben and Eli have done their homework about having the right descriptions and headlines and all that stuff, right? And posted it to YouTube, posted it to all their channels, and had the courage to repost it at least once a month. That video would be a well, very welcome relief to somebody looking for that information. And for those who don't need that information or who find this low quality and boring, who cares? Because they're not looking for your help or your service or what you provide. But to the one who is looking, that's, you're going to be like a sight for sore eyes. You mean I can sign up and get help with tech? So let me do one more with you two. Oh, I just want to add one more note. How cool is it that one, this video has both of them in it. There's like a palling around thing happening, which gives us an impression of who these people even are. And often when we're looking for services and what's called uncertainty reduction, it really helps to have facial and body language lead the message holistically for the viewer. So let's do one more. Let's talk about the second category, which is educating them about their own problems. Ben, would you tell me what kind of, what's a common problem that a smaller, let's say a two person nonprofit generally has before they call you? Cost is one. And I think the other thing is the division of labor or the wearing of many hats in small nonprofit. I think that's part of the purpose of this presentation even today, David, relating to nonprofit video marketing and you're showing how you can do it fairly easily without a lot of budget resources. I wouldn't say time because I think time becomes a cost, right? Yeah. And as someone like myself, who's for lack of a better term, a marketing professional, I think often marketing professionals and people think I got to do this really huge, fancy, elaborate video design with content and whatever else to really make a splash and get people's attention. But if it's not targeted to the right people that you're serving, then it's not really going to do anything. And so we're at Texas we're trying to help people solve some of those kinds of problems, but it's often about the time too, or the know-how. A hundred percent of the time, like do right? the time. It really is time. Everyone comes to me and says, help, and I don't know where to start and who can help me. Where will I find the time? How do I prioritize? How do I even fit this into our budgets? People are just trying to get a sense of this. And get technology has potentially some roles to play within my organization, yep. but damn, the bottom sure where to start. So I want the audience to know that was another video. So if I was with a client, we either we're doing production or training right now, we would have all, but you, what you are witnessing is a recording session where right now we've determined, all right. Ben, Eli, we just nailed our second video. And that video is going to be called who uses TechSoup and what do they usually struggle with? And then you would list off those struggles that you just said in the description. Right. And then you're going to repost it next month, the same video with a different angle. You're going to be like nonprofits that struggle with not knowing where to start and having no time tend to call us. Here's why there's just uh, infinite angles and perspectives to, to tack on to an existing video. Now I want to, two things. I want to offer a document to everyone here, Ben and Eli, how do we do that after the video, after the webinar? I'm going to be sending a, an email to everyone with the video and I'm really happy to include any links to other resources. Okay. So in that, I want to give everyone here tips of just how to get started. And that includes figuring out what exactly is the vital information and then just getting started with even talking about it and then eventually recording it. That's what this looks like. Your tip today is you're going to interview each other and answer together. Just me, Ben, Eli, and I have been doing is answering basic market questions, pretending I don't know anything about TechSoup and then right. asking them about vital information and just start there. You can record later when you're comfortable and post them. And the genius of this is that after two or three of that's the worst part, suddenly you're in the flow. Um, and 
Sorry to yep. interrupt, David. Kevin Kwok has a question. Okay. Uh, looks like, I don't know if you want to answer it now or later, or if Kevin oh, yeah, sure. on camera or what he wants to do. But uh, Kevin, so messaging and positioning is really important. How does one get started in editing that video? That's a big one. So my suggestion for you is to use whatever is, first of all, to have the least edits possible. It's really easy to get in sort of the weeds of editing and take too much time. So the first thing before editing is to just conduct a clear interview the way Ben, Eli, and I have been doing. I ask a question, Ben responds, Eli responds, and so the only edit you really need to worry about is just editing me out of there, editing the question. You can do that with anything for free. If you're using Apple and Mac devices, it always comes with iMovie. Yeah. I use it a lot, actually. That's very fast. And I won't give you a tutorial here. YouTube has about a zillion how to get started on iMovie. And then if you could watch the iMovie tutorial and apply all of those skills to almost any other thing. So a lot of you nonprofits already have a free Canva account, a Canva Pro account. It's free for nonprofits. And they have a great video editor in the browser. Right. So we've been having a lot of success teaching nonprofits to edit through Canva. And again, lots of tutorials on how to use Canva. And do not go start thinking about drone cameras and multiple camera angles and all that stuff. Just start with Zoom interviews, just like this one, and make it as easy on yourself as possible. I saw another question up there. I think it was from Eli. How do you find the right words? I get caught up in my organization's jargon. I mean, and basically you're saying like create these videos that it's really regular humans are searching for. And I'm not totally sure how regular humans talk about my organization so they can get pretty internally focused. Yeah. Sometimes I think, imagine someone from 30 years ago went in a time machine and heard us talking today. First, you want to go on to Zoom and uh, log into your Canva and then go on to your WhatsApp and ping me. I think people would think we were nuts. How to find the right word? I guess you would have to, after your recording, or hey, even after, forget recording. Imagine you spent an hour with Ben just going back and forth, answering each other's questions. Ask somebody that has nothing to do with the nonprofit space or the tech space on to read your read or listen to maybe even an audio recording and ask them, do you understand what we're talking about? They'll tell you yes or no. They'll say, why? What didn't you understand? That's stuff you should be doing in your basic communication and marketing anyway. Forget about videos. Record or write all of your answers and ask someone unrelated to your organization. Do they get it? And if not, go fix that. Someone else here, what, Angela, what is a good length of a video before viewers start losing attention? Okay, so there's a different approach here. I think video length is never really the problem. It's where it is positioned for what purpose. So people will binge a Netflix series over an entire weekend. And so length doesn't seem to be an issue for that. But the positioning had everything to do with it. It was probably some mixture of advertisements, word of mouth, and then a great title and a great description and a great promise. I don't know, an episode description might be like, Joe must go back in time to save Jane because, or else everything will disappear. Like that's just back to the future. And maybe that interests people with sci in like sci-fi, but that was all about the positioning. Now, if I took that whole series and posted it on Facebook and said, check out my video, you're not even going to get one second because there was no positioning. There was no invitation. There was no promise. There was no lead up. But in general, I think you should think about this. People have a very good attention span if you can make them care. So there's a very low consideration span because on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever it is, even Google search results, you're looking at 
about a thousand competing items. So you have, I'd say one or two seconds to get their consideration. And if, you, <clears throat> if you, if your focus audience is youth who have vital tendencies who are between 18 and 25, and you said that in your video post, are you between 18 and 25 and have thought about suicide? Okay. Consideration level you're in. They might, you've increased the chance of watching even a 10 minute video. Hope that helps Angela. For our last bit of time, I think it's up to Eli and Ben. We mm -hmm. could take more. I could summarize this presentation. I could take more questions or we could get someone on the microphone to do another, another session. Yeah. I'd actually love to do another one of these sessions. I think that's been really helpful. If yeah, someone wants to be the next person on mic, just drop something into the chat and I will give you camera powers to so just throw something in there. And as you can see, this is not a terrifying thing. We're not going to put you on the spot. Otherwise I'm going to volunteer some and you don't. Yeah. Unless there must be someone who's video curious <laughs> who, want, who wants to tell the world about their organization and whoever takes that chance today will. We'll get a feel for how useful and how yeah, what do you think? pretty easy it is. Can I put you on the spot? Yep. All right, here's kind of that too. So Summer, you're going to get a little invitation in a moment to turn on your camera, your mic, and also, and do give the browser permission. Anyone else feel like they want to be next? Otherwise I'm going to pick another random name. Hi, Summer. Hi, Summer. Hello. Before what we're, we do our pretend recording, I just need to do two things so that I can do the role play. Tell me what your organization's name is and who your main audience is. So our organization is called Literacy Link South Central, and our clients are adult literacy programs across Southwestern Ontario. So they are existing programs. Yes, they are. What do you do for them? Wait, well, okay. Now we're going to start pretend <laughs> recording. Because... <laughs> I really want to know what, okay, whoa, wait, you do it for existing programs. What does that mean? What do you do? Our organization supports adult literacy programs across six counties in Southwestern Ontario. And how that support looks is different depending on the needs of the individual program. So adult literacy programs serve adults in Ontario who may need to upgrade their literacy skills, math skills, computer skills interpersonal skills, communication skills, and they need anything from curriculum to research, to connection to other programs, to coordination of their services and information about the services that others are offering. So we provide all of those services in addition to providing information about adult literacy programs to organizations and the public outside of the literacy field. And we do a lot of referrals as well. Okay. So that's one video. Next video. How much does this cost? I'm happy to say it's free. Everything we do for our programs is free. And as an adult in Ontario, you can attend adult literacy programs to upgrade your skills for free too. Now for somebody who has no idea about even they're just on their first step about literacy programs at all. Why is it free? And how does that work? What do you want from me? What's the catch? What we want from you is to be able to be as effective as possible in your life in whatever you want to achieve. Why it's free is because the Ontario government recognizes the importance of skill development for success. So whether that success means you've developed the independence you need to live on your own budget, meal plan, grocery shop, and pay your bills, or whether that means you need to upgrade your skills to be effective at a job or get a promotion. Maybe it means you need to earn a grade 12 diploma or an equivalency, or maybe you're ready to move on to post-secondary education and haven't gone to school in many years. If we don't use it, we lose it in a lot of ways. Being able to go back and upgrade your skills means whatever that next step you take is much more likely to be successful. And that's what adult literacy programs are here for. 
Okay, that's video number two. My next question is based on true ignorance here. So I'm an existing, maybe a literacy program, and I've been around for one or two years. We're still budding, figuring this out. What, how do I connect with you? And what does that look like? How does, how, what do I get from this? How do I be eligible? If you're an adult education slash literacy program in Ontario, there is going to be an adult literacy network, just like Literacy Link South Central, whose job it is to help you succeed. So I would recommend people go to the Learning Networks of Ontario website and click on Find My Network, and there will be a map of Ontario. And you can click where you exist, and it will give you the name, address, phone number, email, et cetera, for your local regional literacy network. You can reach out and say, hi, we'd love to invite you to a planning table, to a conversation. If you want somebody to come out and help train your staff on what it means to work in the literacy field, we're happy to help. Is there such thing as a too small or too large organization to reach out? Like I'm nervous to reach out. You're never going to find a more welcoming group of people than those who work in adult literacy. <laughs> We're so excited to help people succeed. There is no such thing as a program too small or a program too large. And in fact, I would say smaller programs can benefit even more from support from their regional literacy network because larger programs often have an internal structure of support. If I'm running a literacy program at one of Ontario's colleges, then I already have an internal structure that can help me achieve some of my goals as a program. Whereas a small, independent, two-person, community-based literacy program, they don't have the staff and the resources to necessarily accomplish everything that can help them be as successful as possible. So that's where our programs can be a really great resource. Are you an actor or are you actually working there? Am I, are you the one that I get to talk to on a call? <laughs> My name is Summer Burton. You're welcome to reach out at me or out to me at Literacy Link by hitting our website. You'll see all of our staff profiles there. It's www.llsc.on.ca and pick up the phone and give us a call. We'd be happy to talk. I promise I'm real. <laughs> okay, everyone, a round of applause for Summer. You can just type a bunch of, I don't know. <laughs> C's for clap. Thanks. So Summer, that was, oh, and everyone who's watching, that was, it helps that you're so well-spoken, but it's possible Thank for you. people who aren't that we made probably five or six videos that you can circulate monthly for the next few years if you wanted. And the thing is, if I am really interested in looking for resources as an existing program, everything Summer just told me is that I'm paying really close attention. It's not just some video. Someone said, hey, check out our new video. I'm like, bet, boring. It's how can I help you improve your program that you're so passionate about? Yes, I'm going to click on this. And just her, just seeing Summer's sort of demeanor and willingness to speak takes me two or three steps closer to feeling comfortable to reaching out. There's just so much more we can achieve if we just talk, give the basic answers, give the a vital information that gets us very far without worrying about video quality and hiring a crew and all that stuff. Everyone, I hope you, uh, you can see just how doable this is and uh, you can do it amongst yourselves, especially with the document that I'll give to Eli to give to you. Thanks so much, Summer. My pleasure. And also thank you so much, David. That's amazing. You take video, which freaks all of us out. We're like, oh my God, it needs to be perfect. And you take all this money and all this time. And it's going to need to capture everything we need to do in one fell stock because we only have so much time and money. And you talked us off that ledge and said, oh no, there's some really practical things you can do. Could it some video, record it, cut it into a couple pieces, ask for the questions that you get every day from people and then use that to to start answering questions, finding the right people who are using that language. I doubt anybody in this room watched Summer's answers and went like, this is terrible and I'm never going to sign up for those programs. Yeah, super inspiring. I think sometimes we need to get paid money to get some data time as well. So we should also let us know about how do we, maybe we need some more David time. How could you help us as an organization? I, I do training one or two clients per month. And that looks to, depending on your needs, it's, it starts with four weeks or eight week training. And we go through, we go through everything we talked about today much deeper. So 
I would spend the time with you coming up with those market questions and those vital questions. There's a structure to it. Now I would spend time with you on how to be on camera and how to make that recording process as easy as possible. And then I would spend time with you again on how to organize that among your team so that the workflow is seamless and fast and does not and eliminates as much technology as possible. So this is a real um, training mentorship role, it sounds like, where you're really teaching people how to fish so then they can go off and can use those skills as they build up their work. That's exactly it. Historically, any we I used to be more interested in doing brand videos for organizations. And the, the impact was just such a gamble. It's such a gamble to do an $8,000 video and pass it off and cross fingers if their marketing team did not have a strategy. So if we can just, it's just so much cheaper and easier to train and follow up and maintain with, and it's the inverse of impact. It's just so odd how that worked out. Other ways to learn is if you go to my website, there's a section called free stuff. So newsletter, podcast, the podcast is like this, where it's just mini lessons, about 10 minutes. And they're always, they're mostly actionable. And then another way is to just message me anytime. I have an open door policy. Ask me anything. I will always answer and it's uh, no charge. Oh, appreciate there we go. Thank you. So David, do you have some final things you want to say or do you want me to take us into the, the wrap up? I think I can do this pretty quick here. When you fill those vital informational gaps, people will watch it. I promise. Homemade is fine. It is a welcome relief. Authentic wins. Search engines and devices are prioritizing video. We have no choice. And you are likely the first one to show up and serve that particular need. You will not go viral. You will not suddenly become famous. But if you do this frequently over time, you will establish yourself as a voice and show up in the searches. 